knows, because um, we've said many times before, I am not responsible for the answers that come uh, from ministers or anybody else. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 12325 in the name of Jenny Mara on protecting Scotland's communities. Members who wish to take part in the debate should press the request speak button now. And I call on Jenny Mara to speak to and move the motion. Presiding officer, can I start this afternoon by publicly thanking our NHS staff up and down this country for the service they give <laughs> and the care they deliver to our patients and families. So many of the stories I hear from our health service talk of the compassion and generosity of NHS staff in the care that they give our loved ones every day. The NHS is our most important public service, owned by us and delivered through the caring hands of NHS workers. And, presiding officer, it is in the interests of all of these staff and the patients and every citizen in Scotland that the Labour Party brought a motion to this Parliament today to lift the veil of secrecy around our NHS in Scotland. For it is confident fearless and robust institutions that have no fear of openness, transparency and accountability. It is in, if you allow me to make a little bit of progress, Mr Macdonald, it is institutions that are open to change and open to improving their services that want the public to know what service they are delivering and how they are measuring up to expectations. Of all the NHS staff I have spoken to, none of them fear nor dread openness and transparency. And that is why the Cabinet Secretary's U-turn on publishing statistics is very welcome, but at the same time, presiding officer, quite baffling. For only two weeks ago today, Shona Robinson stood up in this chamber and told me that publishing a&E statistics on a weekly basis was political interference and was I, I'll take an intervention in a minute, and was I suggesting that she should politically interfere with the publication of statistics? If she would like to tell me if she still feels if this is political interference, I'm happy to take the intervention. Cabinet Secretary. First of all, it was the Chief Statistician that has decided to release this on a weekly basis, which of course Order. I welcome, but on the issue of political interference. Can Jenny Mara take this opportunity to apologise to the staff of the NHS after her political manipulation of statistics, something she refused to do this morning? If she cares about the staff in the NHS, then apologise to them for that gross misrepresentation of the hard work that they do. Please apologise. Jenny Mara. So the Chief Statistician decides to publish on a three-monthly basis and then decides to publish on a one-monthly basis, but after pressure from the Scottish Labour Party, the Chief Statistician decides to publish on a weekly basis. <laughs> Presiding officer, if, if, if the Cabinet Secretary is also saying she had nothing to do with this decision, then I would suggest that she is not in control of what is going on in her own health department. Because presiding officer, less than 24 hours after Shona Robson made that statement on political interference, the First Minister stood up and told us at First Minister's questions that her civil servants had already started to look into the publication of weekly statistics. So I have to ask, presiding officer, was the Health Secretary aware on the 4th of February that the government's policy on publishing A&E statistics was changing? Because it is hard to believe that if Shona Robinson herself had instructed her civil servants to look at publishing this data, that she would then come to this chamber and forcefully say that such a policy was political interference. Or, presiding officer, is it the case that Shona Robinson didn't know what was going on in her own department on the 4th of February? And is it not the case that the decision to publish a &E statistics was not hers, but the First Minister's, and that decisions are being taken on health that Shona Robinson knows nothing about and has no control over whatsoever. This is indeed what the Health Secretary's statements strongly suggest, that she is not in control of decisions on health, but the First Minister is intervening where necessary to clean up the mess. I'll give away later. 
Now, just yesterday, Shona Robson had to make an apology to over 800 people in Scotland who have had their operations cancelled since the new year. And, presiding officer, no, I'd like. No, I've taken an intervention it. already. No, already I, no. The cabinet secretary, no. Ms. Maris, not giving way. Let's not be in any doubt about how bad this is. NHS Tayside have had to cancel over double the number of operations since New Year that they had to cancel in the whole of the last financial year. The number of cancelled operations is increasing exponentially across this country as a result of the pressures on our health service. But, presiding officer, we come to the chamber today with one of our wishes granted. And it's becoming quite easy to get the government to move because no sooner was our motion laid calling for publication of statistics than the Health Secretary or the First Minister, who knows, decided that a new website is to be launched, giving the public the information they need on a &E waiting times with cancelled operations to follow in the coming months. And I think it is worth asking the Cabinet Secretary when she opens her own speech to explain the delay in publishing cancelled operation figures as the Herald newspaper was able to publish them on Monday. So we now have a new website for the public with information on our health service. Very welcome and a great idea, may I say. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary which of Labour's five-point plan for the NHS she or the First Minister will adopt next? Because point one, a review of acute beds would be very welcome too. Since 2007, the SNP have cut beds by nearly 1,200 across Scotland. Point two, mandatory annual cleanliness and safety inspections for A&E wards. My colleague Alex Rowley will talk in some more detail later about the shocking report published last week on the state of the A&E department at the Victoria Hospital in Kirkcaldy. But I know that the Health Secretary will be as concerned as me at beds, chairs and trolleys in that hospital being contaminated with blood. Does she or the First Minister now have a plan to address this? Point three, as she will have heard at the weekend, Scottish Labour would introduce modern day matrons into A&E to ease pressure and ensure the highest standards of cleanliness. No. Point four, sharing best practice. The Health Secretary knows as well as I do that our local A&E department in Dundee hits its targets and beyond. How can these arrangements be shared across the country? How can areas of excellence... I'd, I'd like... I'd like to make some progress. How can areas of excellence help areas of weakness improve? And what will the Health Secretary do to make this happen? Point five, presiding officer, was the website, which the SNP have already adopted and is very welcome indeed. So we also heard yesterday that we are to have the most transparent health service in the world. Presiding officer, that is a very high bar. No, I'd like to make some progress. That is a very high bar, and I will be very interested to hear from the Cabinet Secretary today how that will be achieved and what her, her ambitions are for that. Because to have the most transparent service in the world, it will not simply be a matter of publishing A&E waiting times. Patients will rightly then have a higher expectation of the information and of their health service. What is their whole journey time to be? From lifting the phone to make an appointment with their GP to the point of discharge from hospital. Will the Scottish Government begin to measure and improve that? Each stage, presiding officer, along that journey, there are expectations, there are sometimes delays, stress and surprises. Can this be managed better? And will the government be open about these stages, how long they should take and what patients' expectations will be? Presiding officer, will the duplicity of social unavailability hidden in waiting times end in this new? Yes. Ms Crawford. I wonder, do you not think it's duplicitous that, that Jim Murphy is caught red-handed fiddling NHS figures, and is it not time for the Labour Party to apologise, and particularly Jenny Mara to apologise, which she singularly refused to do earlier on today? Jenny Mara. Presiding officer, I'm not sure if Bruce Crawford's microphone was on. I couldn't hear exactly what he said. I think, I think I got the gist of it. I, I, think, I think I got the gist of it. 
and I would say that no political party or the British Medical Association would have had to resort to putting in freedom of information requests if this government... I'm answering his colleague's point at the moment, presiding officer. If this government had been open, transparent about the information that they're published they and not have to take anyway. the lead from David Cameron and for us to put the pressure on them to, to publish statistics. I, I, I'll give way once Mark more. Mark MacDonald. I suspect the difference is, is that, firstly, the BMA would not have fiddled the statistics, and secondly, secondly, the BMA would have had the good grace to apologise if they had misinterpreted the statistics, which the Labour Party has failed to do. So, for the third time, will Jenny Mara apologise to the hard-working staff of the NHS for the way that the Labour Party has used those statistics to run down our health service? Jenny Mara. As I told Mark Macdonald last night, nobody would ever have to resort to putting in freedom of information requests if this government had been open and transparent in the first place. Presiding officer, the Health Secretary must look at the duplicity of social unavailability because they are hidden in waiting times. And I would expect that this new period of transparency which she has announced will bring that to an end. And I hope she can address that today. Presiding officer, if it is to be the most transparent service in the world, does the Scottish Government plan to match the transparency of the Scottish Ambulance Service, updating their performance on their website every 15 minutes? Delayed discharge, presiding officer, we have not yet heard from the Cabinet Secretary if she will publish figures, and I hope she can clear this up today, on what she has called her greatest priority, and we both agree is the biggest challenge in our health service today. I am surprised that she has not uh, included delayed discharge figures in the transparency project, but she might be able to clear that up. When she does publish these figures, will it be with the openness and accountability that the Scottish Ambulance Service, for example, is showing? Will we be able to see, hour by hour, how many patients are being discharged, how many beds are occupied and unoccupied, how the patient flow through our hospitals is operating throughout the day and on each day of the week? Now, presiding officer, this perhaps sounds fanciful, but if you, take the op if you take the aspiration of full openness and accountability to its logical conclusion, then it makes absolute sense and should be exactly what we are aspiring to in our most important public service in Scotland. Presiding officer, an international report published by McKinsey has concluded that transparency is one of the most powerful drivers of healthcare improvement. It cites a powerful example of data publication in Canadian hospitals, where within a few months of the data's release, average length of stay decreased by more than 30% and unexpected readmissions declined by more than 20%. Now, if data publication could have a similar effect on delayed discharges in Scotland, what a radical improvement that would be. A study published by the New England Journal of Medicine has shown that public data reporting is as effective an incentive as financial rewards yeah, yeah. in increasing providers to improve their clinical performance. Now, none of the NHS staff I have spoken to have any truck with data publication. Indeed, openness and transparency is as much in the interests of our hard-working staff and their own performance in the NHS as it is in the interests of patients. If this evidence is to be taken at face value, the international evidence, then the Scottish Government has created an incredible opportunity this week by setting up this website and this project. You need to bring your remarks to a close. I will. The test will be on how open, transparent and up-to-date their information will be. How innovative and ambitious can they be with this new tool for the success of our health service? Presiding officer, I sincerely hope that they will grasp this opportunity and not have to be forced bit by bit into publishing more and more information like they have been over the past few weeks. The way the SNP, the Health Secretary and the First Minister have come to the publication of weekly statistics has been surprising and disappointing for people who have been at the top of government for eight years. But they eventually reached the right conclusion. You need to wind it's up, It's now Mara. their ambition for this that is critical. Presiding officer, I move the motion in my name. Thank you, Ms. Mara. I now call on Shona Robertson.
to speak to and move amendment number 12325.3, Cabinet Secretary, 10 minutes. Thanks very much. Um, can I first of all thank Labour and Jenny Mara in particular for the fantastic timing of this debate. It really couldn't have been better on so many levels. I'm sure I'm not alone in this chamber in my admiration for the work that staff do uh, in our NHS day in, day out. Both staffing and, of course, frontline funding of the NHS are now at record high levels. But I do recognise that our health services absolutely uh, face challenges. And can I say to Jenny Mara, in particular, to answer to her questions earlier on, we are already rolling out the best practice of A&E on the Nine Wells model to the rest of the uh, A&E estate. And if she had been looking at what we were doing, she would have known that. We are already doing that. And in terms of matrons, I saw Richard Simpson visit shrink at the concept of the matron. We're not in the 1970s. We're in 2015. We call them senior charge nurses, not matrons. I would thought Labour might keep up with what the RCN and the nurses themselves are saying about that. The NHS currently produces a large volume of data on various aspects of its performance and makes that information available on the ISD website. However, while that information is available, I believe it could be more accessible for people who don't regularly work with health statistics. And that's why I've tasked the Scottish Government officials to work with ISD in the coming months to establish a new S um, NHS Performs website to give quick and easy access to key NHS statistics, either by hospital or health board, as appropriate. Something Labour never did in the eight years that they were in power. So it's good that this SNP government will be the ones delivering the most open and accountable and transparent NHS anywhere in these islands. If only Wales would maybe follow suit. But I have written to the Welsh Health Minister suggesting that they may wish to do that because we will lead the way on this. The service will be developed over time to ensure that information such as waiting times, performance, cancelled operations, staffing level, levels and hospital activity rates are read, readily available. The regular collection of year-round a &E statistics first began under this government because it wasn't done under the previous administration at all. And I welcome the Chief Statistician's decision to instigate weekly publication of a &E figures which will make NHS Scotland even more accountable to the public and patients who use its services. These new weekly statistics will also contain more detail on the length of waits than is currently published by NHS England. I have set out in the Chamber before that we have to plan for an NHS not only for 2020 but beyond that to ensure that it continues to deliver effective care for the people of Scotland, free at the point of need, long into the future. We are absolutely committed to a preventative programme which tackles the symptoms and causes of poor health and health inequalities which still too many in Scotland suffer. The, this uh, population health improvement at the same time as reducing demands on the health service in future years is an absolute priority for us. And I want to try and reach as much consensus around what we want our health and social care systems to look like over this longer time frame and the steps that we need to take to get there. That engagement will be ongoing, but I'd like to have reached broad agreement on this plan by the autumn of this year, as I've said previously. And I believe we can achieve a consensus for the future direction of our NHS. And my offer to parties in this chamber, as I've said before, it still stands. Because I believe the people of Scotland deserve no less than our collective endeavours to enhance the NHS for the future. And that's why it was so disappointing for the Scottish Labour Party this week to willfully and deliberately misinterpret data on the NHS. And I hope Jenny Mara will take the opportunity at some point, at some point, to apologise to the staff involved. Because you see, she asked me about apologising about the cancelled operations, and I willingly did so. And I'm big enough to apologise for the things that I think are wrong. Perhaps Jenny Mara needs to be big enough to apologise yeah, for the things that are blatantly wrong that her party have done. And of course, it was a desperate attempt to continue to talk down our NHS. Oh. A desperate attempt. I heard Jenny Mara try to gloss over the issue and claim that they had misinterpreted the data they received from NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Fortunately, in their spate of online deletions, they forgot to remove the actual response they got from Glasgow from their website, although I'm sure it will be gone too, probably before the end of this debate. 
It provides a table breaking down reasons for cancellations. And in that table, as clear as day, it says how many were cancelled for clinical reasons absolutely there in black and white. And it's exactly this sort of fiddling of the figures by Labour that was so evident from their time in office when they had over 30,000 people on hidden waiting lists. That sees more than double the number of people trust the SNP with the NHS and trust Labour. And little wonder after Jenny Mara and Jim Murphy's performance over the last few days. And of course, the reality is that the NHS as a whole is performing better today against tougher targets than when Labour were in office here in Scotland or where they are in office in Wales today. And as Labour tried to deride the NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde's performance on operations this week, I'll just point out that since the introduction of the 12-week treatment guarantee target for inpatients, Glasgow's performance against that target has been 99.9%. 99.9%, something that I think we should absolutely congratulate the board for. But, you know, sometimes taking responsibility is hard, isn't it? Because Labour's reaction to being caught red-handed was to blame one of their poor researchers. Labour said its researchers had miscalculated. I wonder if that's the same researcher that took the picture of Jenny Mara outside Glenwood Health Centre, but it was the old closed down health centre, not the shiny new one, just a few metres away. Yet another attempt to misrepresent the health service. But Labour have been caught out, cannot be trusted on the NHS, and everybody now knows it. The Treatment Time Guarantee Act is a long stop and helps ensure that if someone does have their operation cancelled, that the board works to, the, works to treat them as quickly as possible. And I think, again, the people of Scotland will find it deeply troubling that Labour have previously confirmed in this chamber by Richard Simpson that they would scrap the treatment time guarantee, something I think they will live to regret. Sorry, yes. Richard Simpson. Sir, that is absolutely incorrect. What I said was that you've made it a legal guarantee rather than a target. And a legal guarantee means you're breaking the law for 12,000 Scottish patients a year. And while I'm on my feet, presiding officer, what about the delayed discharges, which are on the standard weekly template, and you haven't even mentioned publishing them, and yet they're available by every board, every week to your government, and you are hiding them. Cabinet Secretary. I'm, I'm very happy to publish as much information as possible, but this government is getting to grips with delayed discharge, something that your government okay. never did. But, but Richard Simpson is on the record as saying that you would get rid of the legal treatment legal. time guarantee. So you want to remove patients' legal rights. I think that's been confirmed yet again in this chamber today, and I thank Mr. Richard Simpson for that. The progress that the NHS has made in recent years has been tracked by the increase in the volume of statistics that are available and allow for comparisons with other health systems. That's why the, the Welsh Audit Office was able to report in January on a comparison between performance on elective surgery within the UK and concluded that Scotland and England are performing better than Wales against the most stringent referral to, uh, to treatment time targets. It's also why, in a minute, it's also why that we can compare a &E performance in Scotland, not only with other parts of the UK, but with other health systems. For example, in 2014, we know that Scotland's a &Es are outperforming those in Canada, New Zealand and Australia, as well as England, Wales and Northern Ireland. I'll give way. Jenny Mar Will Shona Robson publish delayed discharge figures on the website? Cabinet Secretary. I'm happy to publish delayed discharge figures on the website because this SNP government will deliver the most open, transparent NHS information system that within these islands, and we will be very proud to do so. The work of our Scottish Patient Safety Programme has helped bring real benefits through action in hospitals around the country, utilising performance statistics to monitor progress and identify where action is needed. And of course, we saw yesterday the hospital uh, standardised mortality ratios having reduced by over 16% since 2007, a testament to the work of our patient safety leaders and NHS staff right around the country. You, you need to bring your remarks to a close. Yes, yeah, thank you, President Officer. I'm more than happy to talk about how statistics 
statistics can improve transparency around the performance of the NHS. Because I believe that we can actually use uh, the NHS Performs website to tell the, the fantastic story about NHS performance, one that the Labour Party want to talk down. But our staff in the NHS are doing a fantastic job, and I think it builds politicians of all parties not to talk down the NHS. And we will make sure, through NHS Performs, that we continue to tell the fantastic story of that performance across the whole of this country. I now call on Annette Milne to speak to a move amendment number 12325.2 in the name of Jackson Carroll. Six minutes. Presiding officer, uh, when I learned that Labour's debate today was to be about protecting Scotland's communities, I did not expect the focus to be yet again on the NHS, with an unrelenting emphasis on an alleged track of lack of transparency and openness regarding the operation of the service in Scotland. Of course, a major role of opposition is to scrutinise the government of the day, but I find it utterly abhorrent that the NHS is at times being used for party political gain. And regrettably, I have to say, regret, I have to say by both main parties in the chamber, which is why our amendment refers to the use of rhetoric like weaponising the NHS and to claims made during the latter stages of last year's referendum campaign that the future of the NHS would be secure only if Scotland became an independent country. Presiding officer, the NHS is a precious institution to all of us, and any threat to it, real or perceived, is of huge public concern. And the last thing people want to see is it being used as a political tool by parties seeking victory at forthcoming elections. It's far too important for that, and everyone I speak to outside this place wants this to stop, asking that politicians of all parties and none come together in support of our NHS and in developing it for the future. Nobody is denying that our health service is currently and increasingly under very severe pressure and that there are times when it struggles to cope with the demands placed on it. There have always been added problems during the winter months, but as the population ages and many more people are living with multiple and complex health conditions, the pressures on NHS services and staff are relentless and they do struggle to cope with demand. My party absolutely agrees that detailed scrutiny of the NHS is essential as demands on it continue to escalate in an era where resources are tight. And of course this requires the regular publication of rigorously produced statistics and reports, giving all of us, both parliamentarians and the public, an accurate picture of the operation of the NHS. There is undoubtedly now more openness about the NHS than I have known in all my years of involvement with it, and more patient involvement with their planned care. And this is a good thing and must continue to improve. Every week, the Health and Sport Committee receives a list of published Health Improvement Scotland inspection reports. For instance, this week we were notified of nine covering hospitals within four health board areas. The Care Inspectorate also provides much useful information in its reports aimed at improving standards in Scotland's many care homes. Next week, we will discuss with the Health Secretary the recently published report on the seed of outbreaks at the Vale of Leven Hospital, which found many faults and has made many recommendations which, if carried out, should ensure that there is no repeat within Scotland of the failings found in that hospital. And like others, of course we welcome the Government's announcement yesterday that it now plans to publish A&D statistics on a weekly basis. All these measures are extremely important in developing a clear understanding of the pressures on the system and where the need for improvement is identified, how this can be undertaken quickly and effectively. But I think we need to listen to the warning from Dr Peter Benny, Chairman of BMA Scotland, when he says that whilst the weekly publishing of statistics can be a useful indicator of pressure in one part of, a system, of the system, we must avoid reducing the NHS as a whole to a set of weekly performance figures, skewing the public's perception of the service and ignoring the system-wide pressures which extend far beyond A&D. He's absolutely right that pressure on emergency departments is a symptom of wider pressures across the NHS and that problems in one part of the service cannot be addressed without looking at the system as a whole. That is why we respect uh, coalface organisations like the BMA and the RCN when they seek the cooperation of all stakeholders in the NHS, including politicians, in giving thorough and objective consideration to what needs to change to ensure the long-term sustainability of the NHS in Scotland as it faces the inexorable demands being placed upon it. As a start, we need to relieve the pressures on our emergency and acute services by effectively planning and developing primary and social care to keep people within the community at home or in homely settings for as long as possible. 
And that is why it's so important that the integration of health and social care is successfully achieved right across the country. There does need to be very serious discussion and planning about the future of the NHS. And this must involve all health professions which contribute to primary, secondary and tertiary care, as well as the local authority, third and independent sectors on which much community care depends, as well as politicians both at a local and national level. And most importantly, the patients and carers whose well-being depends on a well-run service. Presiding officer, this sort of planning can't be achieved by political point scoring. And not for the first time this year, I would stress the need for cooperation between politicians on all sides and plead that where the NHS is concerned, we look to where we can agree a way forward, working together to find a, a sustainable future for an NHS which has been the envy of the world and whose staff deserve our full support, but are increasingly demoralised by the constant bickering of their elected representatives. Scottish Conservatives are willing and ready to cooperate in this way, and we challenge other parties to do the same. This is what our constituents and the NHS staff who work so hard on our behalf expect of us. The I'm members closing. And this is what they deserve from us. So, Presiding Officer, I, I, I'm looking forward to the open debate, and I hope, I don't, I don't think, but I do hope that it will be conducted in a constructive manner. I'm pleased to move the amendment in Jackson, Car in Jackson Carlow's name, and having studied the government's amendment, we will also support it, assuming that it will be carried at decision time. Many thanks. I now call on Jim Hume to speak to and move amendment 12325.1, maximum six minutes. Mr Hume, we're uh, tight for time. Th thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I say to the Health Secretary how delighted I am that she has chosen to fully accept the Liberal Democrat amendment, which we did have lodged, asking for weekly reporting of A&E figures. It is uh, quite a turnaround. Turn uh, or even perhaps a U-turn, given the government's opposition up until now to this measure. Lib Dems, of course, welcome the Scottish Government bending to opposition pressure to release A&E waiting, waiting times on a weekly basis. The in that information was already available to ministers. It is only right that it is made fully available in the interests of accountability. The move has come about through considerable pressure from across the political benches and was the sole focus of that uh, earlier Liberal Democrat amendment. We have been calling on the move for uh, one day less than four weeks, and it is curious that we should see such a radical change uh, from the government in such a short time frame after such opposition to weekly reporting. Indeed, the Health Secretary claimed that she had no influence over such a move, claiming it would amount to political interference. So it is a pity the government announced the news through the press. Uh, just yesterday afternoon, rather than engaging in a meaningful discussion with MSPs and health spokespeople across the benches in a collaborative way. However, this is perhaps yet more proof it was needed of the power of opposition. Cabinet Secretary. And I, I just correct Jim Hume, the announcement was actually made through the Chief Statistician's office, if he had been paying attention. Yeah. Jim Hume. I saw your words in a Scottish Government uh, press release uh, website just yes, yesterday afternoon. Uh, uh, or I should have didn't see you. You're obviously presiding officer. I saw the cabinet secretaries. <laughs> presiding officers, our dedicated frontline NHS staff strive to provide second to none care for every single patient, and they deserve our respect. Uh, it's incumbent on Scottish government to look at the waiting times issue with times uh, within our AE units and act swiftly for patients and for our NHS staff. That's why Lib Dems have been calling on the government to stand behind the principles of accountability and openness re a &E waiting times. By releasing weekly figures to the public, the government will be subject to tougher, of course, more rigorous, rigorous scrutiny, and I think ultimately this will improve areas we know are failing in some, and some of our a and &E units. The benefits for patients will be obvious, but likewise addressing the problem areas quickly with support for staff will go a long way towards taking pressure off staff and, I believe, boosting morale. So it is cr critically important that this newfound transparency is accompanied, of course, by real action from the government to support our great NHS staff so that they can continue to provide the best care for patients. And that is the crux of the new and revised Lib Dem amendment today. The weekly information will enable us to see the extent of the growing a &E waiting times and where action is needed. We have seen a growing number of people waiting for more than four hours in some departments. We know about the recent Royal Alexandra Hospital incident in Paisley, 
where a special support team was sent to provide help to the a &E sec uh, section there. And, uh, of course, the government claimed that was a responsible move. And at Glasgow two weeks ago, patients had to wait up to 20 hours in a porter cabin to be seen at the Victoria. So we don't want uh, that happening across other areas of Scotland. The severe understaffing and under-resourcing in these situations was hidden in the vast figures of monthly ISD stats. So I think the Health Secretary mustn't be allowed to hide behind a wall of figures. So ultimately, through weekly publishing, the government will quite rightly be held accountable more swiftly, meaning that staff and patients can have confidence that an open conversation with us as MSPs, patients and NHS staff can be had in order to identify and target where help and support for workers is most needed through flexible uh, resources. More accountability, better management of resources. It's a move supported by health professionals also. The BMA stated that the NHS faces pressures in the E units because, as a quote, of wider pressures from across the NHS, causing a &E to struggle to cope with rising demand in the face of increasing numbers of elderly people with multiple health conditions alongside constrained resources, unquote. It becomes then even more necessary to allow for this movement of information, and I would urge the Health Secretary to engage fully on the issues we know are problem areas in the NHS. Royal College of Nurses, uh, Scotland's senior officer, said, quote, many nursing staff working in Glasgow have been in contact with us to let us know how worried they are and concerned about how they can care for patients' safety when there are so few staff and equipment is such short supply, unquote, with warnings of delayed discharges and delayed operations. So the government must improve its record on A&E &E waiting times. I'm sure we all want that. Westminster has... Uh, uh, done it recently, and I'm delighted the Cabinet Secretary has now agreed with the Lib Dems to uh, publish weekly figures. However, it should be a reminder to the Scottish Government that it needs to take heed of what those at the front line of the NHS are, are saying on the wider issues of sustainable staffing, resourcing for the long term. Geriatric beds have been cut by a third since 2010, boarding has soared to 3,000, and our hospitals are being bottlenecked. And in the last two years, 16,500 NHS staff have been signed off work with mental health issues. a &E weekly reporting is one aspect. It's now uh, vital that going forward, the Scottish Government outline what measures it will take in targeting the pinch points we know exist in, uh, in our a &E departments and long-term staffing must close and resourcing must be key to that. I move the amendment in my name on behalf of the Liberal Democrats and look for support across the Chamber. Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate. I'm afraid we are already short for time. Speeches of a maximum of six minutes. Could members who wish to speak press the request to speak buttons? I call Bob Doris to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government has a strong record in increasing transparency and openness within the, the NHS. After all, it was this Scottish Government that began the routine publishing of treatment time statistics, including progress being made towards the 18-hour referral to treatment target and the 12-week uh, treatment time guarantee. And that's to be commended. That's not secrecy. That's to be commended. Likewise, it is the current Scottish Government that began to routinely publish statistics on compliance with the four-hour a and &E target and on the number of 12-hour breaches, not before collected. Labour preferred to keep that hidden. I would ask Parliament on the balance of probability to work out who is secretive and who is transparent. I welcome, therefore, the latest announcement uh, to go further than ever before and make a significant amount of NHS data easily accessible and available from March 2015 on the Scotland Performance website. Indeed, this will include weekly statistics and any performance, and I hope to see a little bit more about that later on in my speech. So across a range of measures, the current Scottish Government has already made far more information available than under any previous Labour administration. For instance, Parliament will remember the farce of Labour's hidden waiting list, where around 35,000 people had no guarantee of when treatment would take place and no public statistics to even admit that they existed or what the length of wait was likely to be. That is secrecy, presiding officer. This Scottish Government ended that system with the new waste system to ensure all patient waits were recorded, statistics published and transparency was brought into the process. Indeed, presiding officer, 
when the Scottish Government identified that system had to actually be improved further during our time of administration, we acted once more and improved it further. And I want to share some further statistics with the Chamber. Uh, and I can assure Scottish Labour these statistics are accurate. I've actually checked them. Um, and I'd like to look at mortality ratios in Scotland's hospitals. If we compare the period from October to December 2007 with the period July to September 2014, in other words, over the lifespan of this current Scottish Government, we see an improvement of over 16 per cent on mortality ratios. The NHS has never been so safe. And I'm pleased to say that the hospitals in my constituencies that I represent, my constituents, including the Western, including Garton Naval, including the Royal, including the Southern General, they actually do better than the, the national picture. And despite some bad press they've been subject to recently, I think that's to be welcome. Uh, presiding officer, all that is publicly available information, but we're never going to hear about that publicly in available information from the Labour Party. The Labour are silent on this. There's a veil of silence from the Labour Party on all of this. And of course, we, we all know why. It just doesn't fit in with their false narrative about an NHS in crisis. Likewise, I don't see Labour keen to tell people about the plummeting levels of hospital-acquired infections and the huge progress that's been made on that. Now, if I recall rightly, the Labour Party have forum in dodgy health statistics in this area. I believe it was Jackie Bailey that rushed for a PR, slamming the level of hospital-acquired infections in Scotland, before realising, of course, the statistics she were using referred to the time period that Labour were in charge of the NHS. So whilst Jackie Bailey was calling Scotland the superbug capital of Europe, the reality was that under the SNP government, hospital-acquired infections were down 70%, 7-0, and were the lowest since records actually began. That's a dodgy dossier. That's misleading people. It's this government that's been open and transparent. And the reason I draw attention to hospital acquired infections is again, it's the current Scottish government that actually established the healthcare environment inspectorate to carry out rigorous inspections and to publish findings publicly and accessible to all. And can I say, presiding officer, sometimes that leads to uncomfortable headlines in newspapers. Sometimes it is uncomfortable press for the Scottish Government. But it was this Scottish Government that established the inspectorate and are identifying what services have to be improved and taking action to improve them. That's why mortality is improving. That's why hospital-acquired infections are falling. Open, transparent, public and accountable. Now, Jenny Mara was on Good Morning Scotland this morning, and when it was put to her that the SNP Scottish Government published more information than any previous Labour government when they were in power, Ms Mara did not deny it, and I welcome that. But instead, Ms Mara said that there was now a different culture, different pressures, and different challenges, and went on to identify challenges in relation to delayed discharge. And I absolutely agree with Jenny Mara in relation to that. But again, selective use of statistics, because what the statistics actually show is that under this Scottish Government, delayed discharge has fallen by two-thirds. Oh. So I'm actually minded to agree with Dr Peter Binney, uh, the chair of BMA Scotland. We've already heard his quote earlier. I'm just finishing off, the I'm afraid, closing. Dr Simpson, because I welcome the weekly publishing of statistics. But picking one week at any given time can skew the public perception of a service, and it's important they're put on the record. But we have to look at the service in the round, and we have to look at the improvement over a long period of time. And the record shows it's this government that's achieved that, and this government's put more information into the public domain than ever before. Rosa Grant, to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I was going to start by welcoming the Government's change of heart with regard to the publication of the a and &E data, but I should obviously be thanking instead the Chief Statistician. It's quite good that the Statistician has told the Cabinet Secretary, who is boss, that they have stepped up to the plate and taken charge of the NHS, something we have been asking that the Cabinet Secretary do for some time. It is really good that somebody has taken on that challenge, because it 
was the right decision. The NHS belongs to the people, not to the government. Yeah. The people have a right to know what's happening and what their expectations should be. We now look forward to the Chief Statistician making a similar announcement on weekly bed blocking statistics and indeed in real time publication of NHS statistics. Only when that happens, we will have a transparent service. Cabinet Secretary. Rhoda Grant um, needs to understand that the Chief Statistician decided on the weekly statistics because that was a statistic that was already out there and he decides on the frequency. In terms of new reporting, we decide on what should be reported if it's not already reported upon. And that's why I've announced the NHS Performs website, something I hope that she will welcome. Rhoda Grant. That is, that, is as, that is as clear as mud, so we have to wait for the Chief Statistician to decide whether to publish the other statistics uh, weekly. I think we know who is in charge. Perhaps the Cabinet Secretary will make an appeal to him to, to publish those statistics. <laughs> Presiding Officer, the last few months in the NHS has been a nightmare for patients and staff. We have a National Health Service unable to cope with basic winter pressures, and it's due to the government's neglect of their duty. They have ignored our pleas for action, but what's more is they have ignored the pleas made by, their st by staff in the NHS, by their trade unions and professional bodies, and indeed they've ignored pleas made by patients. Yet they're still in denial, suggesting we're playing politics rather than highlighting the real concerns of real people, and that's wrong. However, what's worse is they, they appear to ignore the pleas of staff and patients, and they do this aided and abetted, most disappointingly, by their friends in the Tory party. This mismanagement has placed an, an acceptable strain on NHS staff. We know that those in the caring professions work above and beyond the call of duty that's in their nature and if the SNP MSPs think that is funny they should maybe spend some time on the front line working with staff in the NHS who are making up for the, their neglect of that service. The government is abusing that goodwill and that is totally unacceptable. No, I'm not going to take an intervention. I've already taken one. Staff shortages throughout the NHS have meant the withdrawal of some services. Perhaps Order, please. Perhaps Order. if the Cabinet Secretary were to listen to some of the real experiences of patients within the NHS, she may listen in silence and, and at least take some notice of it, because I'm going to highlight some of the issues in my own region. For example, if you have a baby in Sky, you'd better do it within working hours, otherwise you're going to spend several hours in the back of an ambulance travelling to Inverness to maternity services, because there is no out-of-hours maternity services in Sky anymore. That's not a great journey at the best of times. It's certainly not a great journey when in labour. Endoscopy services in Skye have been totally withdrawn, again meaning that patients have to travel to Inverness for their procedures. Locums are running the hospital services in Wick and Caithness, and that's not sustainable. It seems impossible because of lack of training to attract and appoint qualified staff on a permanent basis to continue service delivery as it happens currently. And it's the community and the, the local health board that are coming together to work up, up a sustainable model, not the Scottish Government, the community that are taking this on. And it's absolutely unacceptable until this happens that people are travelling over 100 miles to get procedures that should be delivered on their doorstep. The government talks about care in the community, treatment closer to home. What is happening is the direction of travel is absolutely in the opposite direction. Operations are being cancelled. A constituent phoned me um, a couple of weeks ago and told me the story of an elderly woman, a neighbour of hers, who was waiting for a hip replacement. She was in agony and obviously really concerned about her operation. That was cancelled at short notice due to unscheduled care pressures. But the stress of waiting for that operation has continued and will continue again with her pain worsening until her operation takes place. And if the Cabinet Secretary wants to apologise to her, I will take the intervention. Cabinet Secretary. I, as I always say, I regret anybody who has not had the service that they should expect. But isn't it a great example of what's wrong with Labour's portrayal of the health service that through her speech, particularly about Sky, she did not even mention the fact that I've given approval for the new hospital in Sky. Isn't it about a bit of a balanced view? And won't she now welcome that decision because it's good for the people of Sky? Rhoda Grant, I'm afraid you're in your last minute. Thank you.
I certainly welcome the decision to build a new, new hospital in Skye. It's been a long time coming and does nothing for the mothers who are travelling to Inverness in the back of an ambulance at this moment in time, something that she should be concerning herself with right here, right now. Presiding officer, in Harris, there are no GP out-of-hour services. Patients have to travel to Stornoway to the hospital to access out-of-hour services over the highest road on the islands, a dangerous route at any time, but much worse in wintry weather conditions. That is really not good enough. NHS Highland have informed staff that if they require a bank nurse, they must have someone at nursing assistant grade, not at the grade replacing the, the person that they are taking over from. That is totally unacceptable and puts patients at risk. I'm afraid Pres you need to close. Presiding officer, this government needs to step up to the plate. They need to take charge of the NHS. They need to support the staff who are working extremely hard to make up for their shortcomings and to give the patients that are suffering under their management the treatment they deserve. Thank you. I need to make it clear to members they can't go beyond six minutes. Joan McAlpine to be followed by Neil Bibby. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. We are now almost halfway through this debate and we have still to hear an apology from Scottish Labour after their leader Jim Murphy was caught red-handed fiddling NHS figures and tried to save himself a red face by deleting his false tweets and his YouTube video making those false claims. But talking of red faces, you really do have to have a brass neck to come to this chamber as Jenny Mara did today and praise NHS staff while failing to apologise for undermining their hard work by publishing false statistics about waiting, about operation times. Labour's misrepresentation was not a minor matter. More than 200 of the 292 operations cancelled, cited by Jim Murphy. 200 of those were cancelled for clinical reasons. That's 70%. Ms Mara is on very shaky ground by coming here to talk about honesty, transparency and statistics, given Labour's own appalling record on these matters. On heading waiting lists, for example, or on that embarrassing photograph of Ms Mara herself, outside the Glenrothes Health Centre that had been replaced by a 5.8 million new facility. But Ms Mara in her speech today introduced another blooper uh, into Labour's uh, abysmal uh, record on these matters. She cited the consultancy McKinsey to attack the Scottish NHS. Now, if she had done her homework, and she might end up blaming a researcher for this, who knows, um, Ms Mara should know um, that McKinsey are a company which is regularly um, has been exposed for its role in privatising the NHS in England. Uh, Dr Phil Hammond, the re respected doctor and commentator, say that McKinsey are the firm who, quote, hijacked the NHS in England. McKinsey, for example, drew up many of the clauses in Andrew Lansley's Health and Social Care Bill, the legislation that has taken the NHS in England so far down the road towards privatisation, a road, incidentally, which began with Tony Blair's Labour Party when they established foundation hospitals in England. McKinsey is already benefiting from contracts arising from the Health and Social Care Bill, according to an, invest, an extensive investigation by Tamsin Cave of Spinwatch, which monitors the lobbying industry. Serious concerns have been expressed about the revolving door between the marketised English NHS, McKinsey, and government. Indeed, one of McKinsey's executives uh, was an advisor to Tony Blair, who then went on to head up Monitor, the regulator of the NHS south of the border. McKinsey, of course, worked closely with the last UK Labour government on health and in 2009 produced a report recommending that the NHS in England cut 10% of its staff. Within weeks of the coalition taking power, it had been awarded a £6 million contract by Mr Lansley's department. And of course, there have been serious questions raised about the fact that it represents private healthcare companies around the world and the serious conflict of interest uh, involved in that and its work with the NHS in England. So I think Ms Mara should be very, very careful about who she cites in evidence to uh, trash the Scottish NHS. Dr Hammond um, has praised the NHS in Scotland under this government for rejecting the kind of market competition um, that uh, uh, has destroyed uh, the, or brought the NHS in England close to destruction. 
Uh, this government, by contrast, has a very good record on health. We have 17,000 more nurses than we had under Labour. And that's real nurses. That's not the fictitious 1,000 plus nurses of Jim Murphy's imagination. We have 13,000 more consultants. And perhaps most important of all, patient satisfaction is higher in Scotland than in anywhere else in the UK. According to the Social Attitudes Survey, 75% of patients are satisfied with the NHS in Scotland, compared to 51% of patients uh, where in Wales where the NHS is in Labour's hands. Also significantly, the NHS in, Sc in Scotland is uh, more trusted in the SNP's hands, according to a Servation poll in January. And I have to say that I'm not really very surprised by that statistic, given what we've seen over the last couple of days and the lies that Labour are prepared to tell in order to gain political advantage in this matter. Thank you. And I call Neil Bibby to be followed by Gil Patterson. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in Scottish Labour's debate this afternoon uh, about uh, the need for open and transparent information and the challenges facing our National Health Service. I want to focus my remarks today specifically on the challenges facing the Royal Alexandra Hospital in Paisley, the hospital where I was born, the hospital where I've been a patient as a child and an adult and where I've visited uh, friends and family. A hospital, though, that has recently been the headlines for all the wrong reasons and a, and a hospital where thousands of patients and staff have ba been badly let down and failed over recent months. As has been said already this afternoon, we should have full transparency and openness in our National Health Service. RAH patients want to know what has gone wrong and what will be done to fix the problems their health service is experiencing. So I welcome the fact that the Chief Statistician, along with the Scottish Government, have listened to consistent calls from these benches and finally agreed to make their weekly a &E statistics public. There should be no veil of secrecy. I'll take an intervention. Bob I, I, I appreciate the member giving way. I wonder if the members have the chance to look at mortality rates for the Royal Alexandra Hospital for clarity. It's, it, it's combined with the veil of leaving hospitals. Since this government's been in power, the mortality ratio has fallen. That means it's improved to the tune of 19.6%. Is that something you'd like to welcome under Neil this Bebe. government? Um, I know there have been issues about mortality rates at the Royal Alexandra Hospital, and I would welcome any um, you know, in, in progress in, in, in reducing that. Uh, presiding officer, one statistic we do already know, and it is a shocking one, is that 23 per cent of patients, almost one in every four people, waited over the four-hour target time for treatment at the RAH in December last year. Last week, after concerns had been raised by staff and patients for months, a support team was finally sent in to the RAH, confirming the A&E crisis, a crisis that was apparent to anyone who has spoken to patients and staff over recent months, and a crisis that would have been highlighted at an earlier stage had A&E stats been published more frequently. President officer, it is welcome that a crisis team has finally been sent in, but one wonders if the Health Secretary has a grip on the situation when she denies there is a crisis on the Monday and yet sends in a crisis team to a major hospital on the Tuesday. Yes, yeah, certainly. Cabinet Secretary. I, mean, I don't deny the challenges at the Royal Alexandra Hospital, which is why we sent the team in. What I take exception to is Labour's portrayal that every A&E in Scotland has a crisis. That is clearly blatantly not the case. And will you accept that's not the case? Neil Bebe. There are, there are far too many hospitals that are not meeting their a &E waiting times, and, and certainly the RAH is one of them. And I've been contacted with do by dozens of patients and staff over recent weeks, and I want to share uh, some of their experiences in the Chamber uh, and ask some questions of you, uh, Health Secretary, about them. One woman described to me recently how her mother had a 13 and a half hour wait in a &E with two broken backs and uh, two broken bones in her back. Another told me how her father waited four and a half hours for an ambulance, and when he finally got to the RH, there was no trolleys available and no porters to find one. The Minister will be aware that other patients have waited up to 20 hours. 
But these are not criticisms of the dedicated, hard-working staff at the RH. In fact, several people have provided me with examples of the outstanding work that staff are doing in extremely difficult circumstances. One man even described how nursing staff even turned their eating area into a waiting room for patients who couldn't get a bed when he was in the hospital for a knee operation re recently. Staff are going above and beyond the call of duty. President officer, a significant number of questions on behalf of both patients and staff I have for the Health Minister, and given that she wants to be as open and transparent as possible, I hope she will be able to answer these questions to RH patients and staff. If not in her closing speech, I would welcome a response in writing. How long does the Minister envisage the support team will be in the hospital for? Will the Minister tell us what were the weekly stats for the RH that she received last Tuesday? at noon, the same day when she sent in the support team. Does the Minister agree that there are staff shortages at the RH? Does the Minister accept what staff and patients have been saying about a shortage of beds at the RH to meet current demand? And what does she intend to do about it? Also, given that the Minister has so much to say about cancelled operations, I would welcome if she could tell us how many cancelled operations there have been at the RH over the last few months, because I am certainly aware of constituents who have had cancelled operations. There are questions that both patients and staff are demanding answers to. We have also seen concerns over adverts for volunteers at the RH A&E Department. Does the Scottish Government and the Minister still support the use of volunteers at the A&E Department? Also, the Minister will know that it was reported in the Herald last week that the Government has been made aware of two critical and very serious incidents where patients at the RH have been injured whilst at a &E. People rightly expect such serious incidents to be fully investigated to find out why they occurred and how they can be prevented from happening again. So can I ask the Minister to tell us how many other critical incidents has she been made aware of at the RH and other hospitals in Scotland? I hope the Minister will be able to respond uh, to these questions. Uh, but my final question to the Health Secretary is a simple one. She's called on Jenny Mara to apologise. Given that the NHS Scotland Chief Executive has apologised to patients at the RH, I would ask the uh, Cabinet Secretary to apologise both to patients and staff at the RH for being badly let down by her government because close. our NHS and the RH in Paisley deserve much better than they are currently really must close. Gail Patterson to be followed by Christian Allard. Uh, thanks very much, President Officer. You need to have a, a good sense of humour when you see some of the Labour Party-sponsored motions these days and the way that the motions are actually camouflaged. I don't think you're doing this Parliament any service the way you term the motions in advance and then we end up seeing and talking about something that doesn't fit the bill on how you table the motions. But that just said, who would believe with Labour's re record in this area that Labour would bring a motion to Parliament that reads as it does. Presiding officer, when you investigate Labour's record in comparison to the SNPs, who would almost laugh, you would almost laugh, laugh if it wasn't so serious, with just about every stat of the SNP's record knocking Labour's out of the park. And this is at a time when the Scottish budget has been consistently cut by British governments of all colours. The SNP is delivering record spending with a health budget of over £12 billion and an extra £383 billion this year. The SNP government is delivering record levels of staff with 1,300 1, more consultants, 1,700 more qualified nurses and midwives and 9,600 extra staff overall bringing recruited, uh, being recruited since Labour ran the health service. The Scottish people are not daft, you know. They see the effects of our total commitment to the National Health Service in Scotland. 73% of the people in Scotland are satisfied with the health service, compared to only 63 in England, where the Tories run the health service. Who would have thought it would be possible for the Tories while struggling to match the SNP's record in, in the NHS, satisfaction that they are doing better than the Labour Party, who run the health service in Wales. Who would believe it? With satisfaction records to the tune of a disastrous 
51%. The Labour Party have some brass neck to come to this Parliament here today with this jumped-up motion. But let's not look at the Labour Party in Wales, where they slashed the budget. Ian Gray said, said he, would have ring, he would not have ring-fenced the health budget if Labour had won the election in 2011. Yeah. Well, thank goodness the people re-elected the SNP, or we would be facing the same problems that are, the people in Wales are facing right at the present time. That's what we get when you don't ring-fence. It should never be forgotten that when power in Scotland, Labour were closing Monklands Hospital and Air General Hospital, and at the same time, a salami slicing services at the Vale of Leaven Hospital, with a view to eventually close it. The Vale of Leaven uh, Hospital served, and now thanks to the SNP government, continues to serve a number of people within my constituency, which is one of the many reasons that people tell me how much the, in the area that they trust the SNP on the NHS. What would waiting times be like now without these hospitals that have been uh, seen, which would have been closed, and where you would have over one million patients uh, not been able to attend these hospitals? As far as transparency goes, it was the SNP government that routinely published statistics with four-hour uh, four A&E targets, and on the number of 12-hour breaches, what did Labour do? Labour buried them and kept them secret. We introduced routine monitoring, mon monitoring and reporting of hospital-acquired infections. We created the Health Healthcare Environment Inspectorate to carry out rigorous inspections, and we instructed, yes, we instructed them to publish these findings. Some... Order. Thanks very much, President Officer. Uh, I mean, it, don't bother talking to me. You should really contact the BBC, who will put your mince out whether it's you know, been cooked or not. When we come to power, there was a shortage of dentists in some parts of Scotland. In some locations, best described as chronic. We brought in an additional 430 dentists. We have increased the number of GPs by 7% and reduced the number of service managers to 29%. We are making a difference. At the end, it really counts. Final minute. Exceeding the target set in April by this year in that regard. Funding is in place to ensure 500 new health visitors posts will be created in the NHS over the next four years in Scotland. This list goes on and on. The Labour, Labour Party and the business of talking the National, National Health Service down. They claim disaster after disaster paint a false picture of the NHS in the minds of the people of Scotland. They are prepared relentlessly to do our services down just to attack the SNP. Hardly what I would call protecting Scotland's communities, more about protecting the Labour Party seats. The health service is expendable by Jim Murphy and the Labour Party. How could it be otherwise when all the indicators and that although these challenges to challenges we need to face it will be consistent, how else can it be other than Labour taking down the SNP and I talking suppose, down the, the National Health Service in, in Scotland? You should be completely ashamed of yourself using this motion today and the way that it's been handled suppose, in the please. last few days. It's a disgrace. Christian Allard to be followed by Anne McTaggart. Thank you, President Officer. And like Jake Patterson, I would say what a shame the way it has been handled the last few days. A, a few weeks ago, I shared with you my surprise that Labour tabled a motion for debate about health on the of Scotland's future title. Today, Labour at it again on the misleading title protecting Scotland's communities. Here we are talking about health again. If anyone from Labour would like to apologise, please stand up. No, I thought not. The only explanation to, to do exactly this, to, to put a motion which has absolutely a title which has got nothing to do with the motion. It's misleading, nothing else. The only explanation, President Officer, is that orders are coming from London to weaponize the NHS. That's the only one I can find. 
No distinct message is allowed in UK Labour PLC. We therefore must debate NHS Scotland again. However, I won't pretend like others that the NHS is a UK organisation. We might have similar challenges, but the way we are responding to those challenges is very different. Let me repeat my own words of a few weeks ago. Under an SNP government, we have not only protected the NHS budget, but we have increased it despite the cuts to our own budget, Tory cuts supported by Labour at Westminster. The picture the Labour Party has been desperate to paint since the beginning of the year in this chamber is not based on facts. You would think there is an election looming, presiding officer. I pointed out that the Scottish branch of the Labour Party desperate attempts to run the same campaign against the NHS as UK Labour is running in England won't work. Labour has been found out time after time. Not only NHS Scotland is performing better than the NHS in England, but this government has shown leadership working in collaboration with NHS boards and local authorities to set out a great vision for an integrated health and social care service. I can report, President Officer, that NHS Grampian is working seamlessly to implement the SNP government vision, a vision that will address the challenges that all health services in the UK and beyond are experiencing just now. The pressure on social care services has been recognised. This government has put in additional money to deal with delayed discharges. Part of the problem within NHS Grampian is that Aberdeen City Council has got rid of its care services to an arm's length company causing delayed discharges to rise dramatically. I know the member for Abidin Central, uh, he reminded the chamber quite often that Bonaco Care, the arm's length company of Abidin City Council, has become a smoke screen to hide the failings of the Labour run administration. Kevin Stewart tells me quite often in the train on the journey back to Aberdeen that when he was a councillor, there were no delayed discharges. Would Labour in Aberdeen apologise? I think not. This is my third com contribution to a debate about health this year. And in every one of them, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for Health and the First Minister for visiting our North East hospitals. And yes, on Monday, the Health Secretary was in Aberdeen speaking to the board and the staff at Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. And I thank her for this. NHS Grampian is recruiting more nurses, and I heard firsthand last Friday how better the new board is at investigating and responding to complaints. I suggested to the board and elected representatives present that we are, all have a responsibility to not only highlight the complaints, but also the many positive feedbacks from patients, and making sure these positive feedbacks go back to the staff, to the NHS staff, because there are many. I would like to congratulate both the new chair of the board, Professor Stephen Logan, and the acting chief, chief executive, Malcolm Wright, for deciding to conduct the public board meeting in a new, transparent way, which is very, very important and goes exactly at the same pace as the Scottish Government is taking just now. There is a lot to celebrate in Grampian, a lot to be positive about. This government has allocated a 49.1 million increase to the health board's budget for the next financial year. This equates to a 6.3 per cent rise, presenting officer. The SNP government is showing commitment to deliver for the North East. NHS Grampian funding is now within 1% parity with other NHS boards around Scotland, one year ahead of schedule. Uh, yesterday, our first minister, Med cancer patients uh, when she officially opens the new state of the heart 13.6 million radiotherapy department in Aberdeen. I look forward to many more visits from both the Scotland's Health Cabinet Secretary and the Scotland First Minister. There is a lot going on, a lot of good news for patients in the region. Uh, two new projects have been unveiled a new cancer centre and a new hospital, which we are still debating what name it should have. Final minute. These two uh, projects are part of the 120 million Scottish Government National Delivery Plan programme. The new hospital will be paid on the non-profit distributing the NPD module, and the project will be on the design, built, finance, and maintain contract over 25 years. Again, presenting officer, taxpayers' money used by public health and under 25 years contract. Will Labour stand up and apologise for the amount of debt that we have created with PFI? The cost of private financial initiative repayments is one of the reasons why Labour cannot be trusted with the NHS. You can stand up and apologise. Final minute. The member's closing. I'm closing. Dr Simpson, the, briefly then. The, 
the presiding officer will decide. He was taking Labour interest. cannot be stressed to have NHS. Well, he is closing, but running out of time. NHS Scotland has not public support because NHS staff in Scotland are working tirelessly under pressure to deliver high quality must care close, to please. patients. I have a message for London Labour, bringing as many help debates to this chamber as you wish, and make sure to speak please to every close. one of them. Presenting officer. Can I point out that members can only take interventions if they can do so within six minutes? Anne McTaggart to be followed by Mike McKenzie. Thank you, President Officer. Sign officer, I am pleased to take part in this important debate on protecting Scotland's communities. We know that Scotland's health service is facing significant pressures, whilst at the same time having to make major changes to services in order to meet future needs. Presiding officer, it pains me to read the horror stories and hear about the horror stories that have been coming out of the NHS almost daily over the past few weeks and particularly the stories within my own region of Glasgow. The recent petition from the Royal College of Nursing signed by over 7,000 people complaining at inadequate staff parking at the new Southern General Hospital should have been predicted. When the new Larbert Hospital opened in 2010, the main complaint was lack of parking for cars. Why is the same problem arising again, just five years later, when the next new hospital is being built? Certainly. Cabinet Secretary. Anne McTaggart realises, and I hope she realises, that the application for additional car parking at the moment is with Glasgow City Council, and indeed it is Glasgow City Council's responsibility to resolve the residents' parking issue. Surely she would acknowledge that in a more balanced view. Anne McTaggart. Cabinet Secretary, I would have well thought that the infrastructure of a brand new built hospital would have been looked at, not just by Glasgow City Council. And 7,000 people that have signed this petition obviously don't approve of, of what is currently there. It is simply unacceptable that our hard-pressed NHS staff should have to worry about parking. Many nurses and doctors will be on shifts requiring them to be in early and leave late in the darkness. Their safety as well as ease of transport should be a priority. This should have been monitored by the Scottish Government so that this issue was foreseen and tackled. Figures published recently showed that the A&E patients across Scotland are being let down. The percentage of patients being treated in A&E for four hours or less dropped from 93.5% in December 2013 to just 89.9% in December 2014. The accident and emergency department in the Glasgow's Western Hospital has the worst figures in Scotland. 31% of patients wait longer than four hours and is the worst in the country for accident and emergency waiting times. The waiting time stats for the month of December last year show that the Western met the target for 69% of its patients, meaning 548 were waiting for more than four hours. It also shows that 242 had to wait of more than eight hours. And more worryingly, for 13 more patients had to wait more than 12 hours. The reality is that hospitals are simply understaffed. Scottish Labour has highlighted time and time again about the daily problems facing hardworking NHS staff across Scotland. What is needed is more doctors and nurses in our a &E departments. Scottish Labour had one principal demand in the Scottish Budget – protect the NHS with an additional £100 million frontline fund. This would have allowed hospitals facing extra pressure to have planned surgery at the weekends and diagnostics in the evening. Developing this approach would also allow for patients to have a health service that suits their lives such as elective surgery, out with their working hours. Although we on these benches welcome the U-turn from the Scottish Government on the weekly reporting of A&E figures, it came too late as the current NHS crisis could have been discovered much earlier as the Ministers were aware of this crisis since the autumn, yet it has taken until now to admit it. Presiding officer, 
It is not good enough that the people of Scotland are forced to get the information they need on their NHS from the freedom of information laws under the SNP government. Therefore, I strongly believe and call upon the Scottish Government to publish the weekly figures for each hospital rather than for each health board every week for both, I'm pleased to hear that Cabinet Secretary, for both A&E and delayed discharges. Final minute. Figures in order to foresee such crisis in the future and allow people to observe the performance of their local hospitals. In conclusion, presiding officer, there are serious problems in the Scotland's health service with a lot of secrecy behind important statistics and behind each one of these statistics there are vulnerable patients and their families suffering. And that is why the government needs to take urgent action right now as there is no time to waste. Thank you, Mike McKenzie. To be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, presiding officer. I'm delighted that the Cabinet Secretary has announced the weekly publication of the A&E performance data and is continuing, uh, not, not just as early in my speech as this, uh, Mr Hume, um, and is continuing the trend established by this government to publish increasingly accurate information on the performance of our health service. I'll take your intervention now. Jim Hume. Uh, th thank you very much. I thank uh, Mike McKenzie for uh, letting me take a, uh, an intervention there. You mentioned you've thanked the uh, Cabinet Secretary for uh, this announcement, but the Cabinet Secretary was quite clear it wasn't her. It, it was the Chief Statistician. Mike McKenzie. Thank you, Mr Hume. I think if you paid closer attention to what I was saying, rather than to the point you were endeavouring to make, you would have understood that what I said was, I'm delighted that the Cabinet Secretary has announced. Um, I think there is no contradiction there whatsoever. But of course, this is important. This is important in the interests of transparency. And it's important in order to provide a reliable guide to the effectiveness of our health services. And perhaps it's also important to help prevent the Labour Party from making fools of themselves. And this is not a trivial point, because whilst the Labour Party are at liberty to bark up their own trees as much as they like, they should take care with their politicisation of health matters. Because the effect is sometimes to place our hard-working health workers under even greater stress. The effect is often to subject them to a siege laid on them by the Labour Party. And the effect is often to criticise them on false premises, merely to try and score political points. The last thing our hard-working health workers require is to have their morale sapped in this way. And it's sad too, President Officer, that the Labour Party cannot think of a more constructive way of acting in opposition than to endlessly criticise our health service, especially because the facts speak otherwise. Patient satisfaction with the Scottish Health Service has never been higher. The 2014 British Social Attitude Survey, published only last month, indicates that 75% of people in Scotland are satisfied with the NHS, compared to 65% in England and only 51% in Labour-run Wales. And health funding has increased to an all-time high, despite the reduction in the Scottish Government budget. Every penny of Barnet Consequentials has been passed on to the health service budget. And that is why we have got 1,300 more consultants than we had in 2006. That is why we have got 1,700 more qualified nurses and midwives than we had in 2006. And that is why overall we have got 9,000 extra NHS staff than we had in 2006. And of course, presiding officer, there is merit in producing these statistics. The public have a right to know how our health service is performing. That is why this government has done more than any previous government to increasingly publishing meaningful statistics, not to wrongly lay the blame at the door of our hard-working health workers, but to rightly tell the relative success story that is the Scottish National Health Service, our 
Scottish National Health Service that, despite the many pressures on it, is performing better than it was when Labour was in last in office in Scotland. Our Scottish Health Service that is performing much better than the Health Service in England. And our Scottish Health Service performing much, much better than Labour-controlled health in Wales. And the health record of Labour when they were last in office in Scotland is not a good one. It's a story of hidden waiting lists. It's a story of Ian Gray's refusal to make a manifesto commitment to maintain the health budget. And it's a story of planning to cut a es at Monklands and at Ayr. President officer, the Scottish people spoke loudly and clearly on Labour's record on this and other issues in 2011. They'll soon have another opportunity to speak. I suspect they'll speak loudly and clearly once again. Final minute. The Labour Party seem to think that Mr Murphy is a prophet. In reality, he's a pied piper and he's not leading them into the promised land. He's leading them further and deeper into the political wilderness. Thank you. I call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Alex Shirley. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, there is a word that uh, is often overused in politics today, and that word is crisis. And too often, opposition politicians use this word uh, on almost every issue or press release that, that they send out. And we have heard it uh, today, uh, yet this is so far from the truth. Now, admittedly, the first person to use the word crisis was my colleague Bob Doris, but he was actually commenting uh, about uh, comments that the Labour Party had actually made. Uh, but we did hear the word crisis being used by Anne McTaggart uh, later on in her contribution. Uh, but certainly, what actually is a crisis? A crisis is something that's actually happening in eastern Ukraine or in the Middle East. That, well, the issue over health st stats or what is happening in NHS in Scotland is not a crisis. No matter which version of Jim Murphy's press release or Twitter or YouTube or video you're actually reading or watching. Now, Dr Simpson earlier on commented, uh, about it. No one had actually mentioned uh, the word uh, crisis. But in actual fact, uh, yesterday, Jerry Maris, uh, she, she did it yesterday. Jim Hume, uh, he uh, used the word yesterday. And the Daily Record of 18th of February, Gemma Doyle used it. Daily Record of the 3rd of February, Jim Murphy used it. Daily Record of the 13th of February, Jim Murphy used it. So uh, the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats have been using this word to try to talk down our NHS. The budget which this Parliament recently approved uh, will see for the first time ever over £12 billion spent on our NHS in Scotland. And this includes an increase of over 300, well, of, of £383 million this year. And that is a staggering amount of money. But even if we were, we were to actually increase that amount by up to, say, another £5 billion or £10 billion, there would still be issues that need to be addressed because it's such a huge organisation. It's how we deal with these issues as they arise that's actually important. And yes, we should be looking at ways to minimise uh, issues uh, within the NHS in Scotland, as it is a massive organisation, but also reaches into every area, every community and every family in Scotland. But there will always be issues which will arise. However, what is not helpful is the almost hysterical level of condemnation, attack and vilification poured onto the NHS by members of the Labour Party. Whilst most Scots see the NHS as an institution to be treasured, respected, uh, a wee moment, to, to be treasured, respected and supported, Labour see it as another attempt to get a cheap shot in the press, another over-egged press release piling up, piling up one stoked-up crisis after another, pouring scorn on the NHS and its workforce. And I'll take you into this. Rhoda Grant. I, I've listened to the member with awe and interest. How does he think that we are pouring um, scorn on the NHS? What we are asking the government to do is support the NHS, its workers and indeed its patients, so that we can all enjoy the services we very much want. It's the neglect of his government that have led to these problems. Jimmy Mill. Well, I actually think an apology from the Labour Party uh, after the, the comments over the last 24 hours would be a start to actually prove that the Labour Party actually do like the NHS as compared to the condemnation and vilification that they have been putting out over the last 24 hours and beyond. The Labour Party, uh, the Labour, the la the, to Labour, uh, the worry and the concern 
that they are actually inflicting upon the NHS employees, the volunteers, and even the patients as merely collateral damage as they seek to tarnish it in order to get their spokespeople in prime slots on radio phone-ins or on TV or on breakfast news pro broadcasts. It's time Labour stopped talking down the NHS in Scotland. And after all, before the 18th of September 2014, didn't they tell us that the NHS was safe if Scotland voted no? Now it seems that we have to forget those Labour words. Today's motion calls for a culture of transparency and openness with regular publication of stats and reports. However, it makes no mention of the costs of providing this information. Speaking from personal experience, when I worked in the private sector, one of my duties was to analyse uh, stats and produce regular reports. And they don't come with no cost attached. There is the staff time needed to record information to compile the stats, uh, as well as to produce the reports, as well as any costs in publishing the information, either in a printed format or in an electronic forum. And I would hope that Labour politicians are well aware that the calls for increased information, even if it is already being collated, will result in additional costs. And I would be grateful if the Cabinet Secretary I can certainly can inform the Chamber uh, as to who will actually be bearing this cost. Will it be the ISD or will it be the official statistics? But uh, I do welcome the introduction of the weekly statistics, and if it actually, if it does, if it continues uh, the excellent progress of information reporting uh, from the SNP since we came to power, then I think that certainly would be an, be an, an, advan it would be an advantage, certainly to uh, the NHS and certainly to Scotland's patients. ISD Scotland already compiles a significant amount of NHS data, which can be accessed easily. Uh, there are other methods. I mean, we're all MSPs in this chamber. There are other methods for us to actually obtain information. We could write parliamentary questions. We could write letters to the ministers, the cabinet secretaries. We could actually ask for meetings with the cabinet secretaries and the ministers. These are things that we could actually do. There's also the, the other option of using the FOI requests to access further information. However, maybe some members in the chamber, uh, maybe some members in the chamber can take a wee bit of advice on this. Uh, when someone submits an FOI request, it's usually helpful if they understand what they're asking for before actually running to the press complaining that the information says something else. I think it does seem approach, strange please. that Labour politicians who haven't got the hang of FOI requests and knowing what information they're after are now running around demanding more information. Do we have any guarantees that they will actually understand it when they receive it? Thank you. Thank you. And I now call Alec Riley to be followed by Richard Lyle. Thank you very much, President Officer. They do say that the best line of defence is attack, and boy, have we seen plenty of that coming through these benches here today. Um, can I say that, that, and I would say that, that the, the first um, ability to be able to start to tackle a problem is to acknowledge that you have a problem. And if we're going to sit in denial where there are issues that have got to be addressed in the National Health Service, then we won't make progress. Joan McAlpine talks about record levels of consultants. The last time I checked in five, there was 37.7 consultant posts not filled because they were unable to fill them. And companies like Medinet were flying up people, consultants for England at the weekend to do homers in five. And I've raised with your predecessor, the, the, the previous secretary, Alec Neil, specific cases of where, where that actually went wrong. And also talking about record levels of numbers, well, we're seeing more nurses, which I've welcomed going into NHS 5, but it's because we were highlighting the issues. Can I say, before I came into this place, I spent two years as the leader of Fife Council, and during those two years, I was consistent in raising my concerns about the assumptions that had been made through the previous right of Fife exercise that had put together how our hospitals would be coordinated and how health and social care would be run in Fife. And since coming into this place, I have consistently continued to raise those concerns because I meet with nurses, I meet with staff in the hospitals on a regular basis and I can see the pressures and the challenges that are there and that's why I met with the predecessor Alec Neil to discuss many of these issues and I was grateful for the meeting with the Health Secretary just last week, the week before. And can I say that, that I'm consistent also in praising the hard work and the care and the commitment which 
I certainly, as a, and my family, have seen firsthand for NHS staff in Fife, and that's why I'm so vocal on this issue because I'm so passionate about the National Health Service. And just as it was the greatest creation of the last century, we have a duty as politicians in this century to ensure that the health service can move forward and can be modernised to meet the needs of this century. Now, last week, the week before last week, there was a report published. Um, accident emergency. The, the, a, a healthcare environment inspector carried out an unannounced visit to the Victoria Hospital. And what it did say was that, that in the majority of wards and units uh, inspected, the standard of environmental cleanliness was good. And that's the starting point, because that's what you would you'd expect within a hospital. It then went on, however, and said there was an exception in accident emergency in Ward 5, uh, the care of the elderly ward. In these areas and in the ICU, there were significant levels of dust. Concern was raised about the cleanliness of equipment. Um, the accident emergency trolley frames were contaminated with blood and bloody fluids, chairs, blood gas analysers, bed frames were contaminated in the accident emergency, and I could go on. The Minister has obviously read all this, so I'm not going to continue to go on with it. The Chief Inspector said that, that, that basically they, they were extremely disappointed, so much so that they raised their concerns with the Scottish Government. Now, I would say to you, without going through and reading every bit of that, what I would say to you is that we have a responsibility and a duty as parliamentarians where, where those kind of issues are highlighted. We have a duty, surely, to come to this place and raise these issues and raise other issues of concern regarding the health service. That should, not be seen, that should not be seen as somehow attacking the health service or attacking health staff. Quite the reverse. We're on the side of the health service and health staff. Yes, Minister. Robinson. I agree with that. However, you are the first speaker on the Labour benches to actually offer a balanced speech, which actually recognised the good things that are happening, as well as highlighting the difficult issues that have to be resolved. And that's the difficulty we have, is that there is no balance from Labour in the main. And can I reassure Alex Rowley on the point of the report? The HEI inspection will go back into that hospital and will absolutely make sure that those uh, issues that are not good enough are absolutely resolved. And I can give him that reassurance. Well, thank the Minister. And, and, and I would say to you that I have consistently called in Fife for a review of NHS Fife's ability to meet the health needs in Fife. There was a report that came out a few weeks ago in the Courier about accident emergency waiting times, and it compared Fife with Tayside and said that, I can't remember if it was Tayside had no problems, but they certainly didn't have a lot. NHS Fife had significant problems. And so what I'm saying to you is in this term crisis, NHS Fife seems to have bounced from one issue to the next to the next. And again, I do come back to what assumptions were made when the, the, the reconfiguration of health services were put in place in five. I remember back in the 1980s studying at a university in this city, and there was a report that came out, the Griffiths Report, and it talked about that was the start of community care, and it was the, the Conservative Party that were in power at that time and commissioned that. And I remember making the point that community care would not be care on the cheap. There are major pressures in terms of health and social care. So I would appeal to you, let's work together, but let's not pretend that everything's rosy or attack everybody when they try and raise issues of concern. Let's be proud of our National Health Service and work together to build that service so that we can be confident it delivers for all our citizens. Many thanks. And I now call on Richard Lyle. Four minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, President Officer, and I notice that uh, everyone's taking two minutes off me. The issues facing the National Health Service are indeed important ones, and despite this Labour motion trying to claim otherwise, this SNP Scottish Government is taking on board and addressing those issues. The SNP vision for the NHS is that Scottish NHS should remain a publicly delivered service, and I believe as long as the SNP Government are in power, it will remain a publicly delivered service. Unlike that of Westminster, condemn governments that marches the English NHS down the path of privatisation in order to facilitate this vision, the SNP has met its commitment to protect the NHS budget. Health resource budget for the year 2015-16 will be a record, record £12 billion. 
The Scottish Government, no, I don't have time. The Scottish Government announced an extra £65 million will be made available to NHS this year. These funds will help to alleviate some of the pressures, ensure that NHS can continue to deliver and sustain the care of all the patients across Scotland. This is in spite of a 10% cut in the fiscal resource budget of Scotland by Westminster since 2010. I hope people remember that in May. Meanwhile, the Scottish Government have increased the, the health resource by 4.6% in real terms. The Government are putting their money where their mouth is, the Scottish Government that is. It is a pity that Westminster won't do the same. But then, of course, presiding officer, we have those on the other side of the chamber, the Labour Party, a party with poor record in government and the handling of the NHS, and it leaves a lot to be desired. We only need to look right now, south of the border, the only part of the UK where Labour is still in power in Wales, when the Welsh Labour Party have a poor record in dealing with their National Health Service. Perhaps Carmen Jones will take tips from the Labour Party in Scotland. Who knows? Jenny Mara's motion highlights an issue over transparency and goes even further into saying that it's a veil of secrecy. Would that be the same veil that the Labour Party used during their term in government when it came to hidden waiting lists, an issue which this government abolished, sometimes they fa something they failed to do for eight years, despite acknowledging that they were not in the interests of patients? This SNP government does act in the best interest of patients, presiding officer. In fact, so much so that patients here in Scotland have a high satisfaction in their NHS and indeed the confidence of the public in looking after and protecting the NHS sits with the Scottish National Party and this government. Under this government, there has been a steady increase in the publication of statistics about the performance of NHS. So I hear the Labour Party pontificate from high across this chamber about our lack of transparency. I can't think of the hypocrisy they show when they, they, their record of openness was so, solely lacking during their administration of Scotland's NHS. The NHS belongs to all of our citizens, and any improvements or views on how it can make it run better are always welcome. This is how this government acts on all areas of our responsibility and how I am sure it will continue to do business. The National Health Service is close to all of our hearts, and that's why we on these benches, and in particular the SNP, will never stop doing its best to make Scotland's NHS ever healthier. I remember when the, the Labour Party threatened to close the A&E in Monklands. I remember the views of the community, but it was the SNP government that saved Monklands, protected it from closure. It's continued with that service. Hundreds of thousands of patients since then have been treated in Monklands. Where would these patients have gone if not to Monklands? They were swamped, Wisher. They were swamped here, Myers. That speaks volumes for our NHS and how we protect it. As far as I'm concerned, presiding officer, it's better to be with the SNP for our NHS. Okay, many thanks. And we now move to closing speeches, and I would take this opportunity to remind members that we'd be grateful of their presence in the chamber if they have already taken part in the debate. So I hope they will return soon. Mr Hume, six minutes or thereby. All right, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. As I, oh, I mentioned in my opening speech, Lib Dems have long been calling for the weekly publication of A&E Waiting Times, and such a move, we believe, would make the system more transparent. And the government, of course, will have nowhere to hide when things go wrong. So I'm pleased to see that this has happened. Uh, but, of course, we can't rest back and expect just more stats to fix NHS issues. The Scottish Government has some tough questions to tackle in creating a more effective a &E service and ultimately be better supported by government in meeting waiting times and maintain smoother patient pathway. Joanna. Member for taking an intervention. I found it a bit strange his opening remarks regarding the cabinet secretary hiding behind figures. You know, he was talking about a wall of uh, of statistics. Is it not the exact things that he was asking for? Jim Hume. I think I'm referring to the ISD figures that would come out on what we called Superstats uh, Tuesday, once a month. Uh, it was a pile of statistics, and it was like a wall and very difficult to get through. So, getting weekly tar targets are exactly what we wanted. MSPs across this chamber this afternoon have acknowledged the need for more transparency, and as we know from core health sector groups like the BMA and the Royal College of Nursing, that this is only the first step on the right path to a more efficient NHS. As members have noted, it's taken a U-turn to get there, and a very welcome one at that. 
I know it was not the Government's previous positions. It has changed in the course of a very short time. And I would echo my view that this Government needs to adopt an open policy of working across the benches on such important issues of policy like NHS, and I am happy to work with them on that. Nonetheless, the focus of the Lib Dem amendment is to seek assurances today from the Scottish Government on how it plans to use the information. The goal is obviously not to overwhelm the public, Parliament and health specialists with a flurry of information simply for the sake of obtaining it. So we must always remember that what has to be noted is that the ultimate goal is a transparent system where ministers can't hide behind that mountain of data that I referred to and where problems areas within the A&E departments are tackled head-on through targeted support and resources for, of our NHS staff. Uh, relieving this current A&E crisis that has developed in a complex area, taking into account a number of many factors. And we know there's a particular problem around understaffing and resourcing. There's been a repeated call from the doctors and nurses who tell us that increase in A&E waiting times are a result of the compounding effects of pressures in other areas of the NHS. The BMA is warning that Quote, we must avoid reducing the NHS as a whole to a set of weekly performance figures, skewing the public's perception of the health service and ignoring the system-wide pressures which stretch far beyond A&E. Lib Dems look to the Health Secretary to spell out what measures her government will take in a bid to remedy this crisis in our departments of A&E. So while keeping A&E units open is a move to ensure that uh, communities have quicker access to care. It is not sufficient to have the infrastructure without the proper procedures, staff and resources. Uh, the case in point that has been mentioned several times is the Royal Alexander Hospital in Paisley. Not enough for the government to claim that it does something to address the NEA problems. It also knows to show how it will. It is then evident that what we need to do is, uh, now is ensure that the government manages to handle the released information in such a way as to have real tangible results. If we want to be able to truly resolve the NE issues, it is a task that the Scottish Government must act upon and not simply divert the attention of the public by agreeing just to publish the information. So we want to see this information used actively in such a way as to develop flexibility among the resources of the NHS, taking primary input from the experts, dealing with patients on a daily basis. So whether it is staff shortages or material or financial shortages that can be mitigated by better analysis of the A&E cases, or whatever the needs of the invaluable NHS staff that we do have. This weekly information will be of little use and value without proper use and application to fix the root of the problems. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government can no longer hide behind that wall of stats once a month. We now need to see real and tangible measures that will fix the problems in our NHS. Ministers will hear what NHS staff, health professionals, and patients are saying. However, this should be a reminder to the Scottish Government that it needs to take heed of what those at the front line of the NHS are saying uh, on the wider issue of sustainable staffing and resourcing for the long term. We know that geriatric beds have been cut by a third since 2010, that boarding soared to 3,000, and our hospitals are being bottlenecked. And in the last two years, 16,500 NHS staff have been signed off work with mental health issues. A&E weekly reporting is one aspect. It is vital now that, going forward, the Scottish Government outline what measures it will take in targeting the pinch points we know exist in some of our A&E departments, and long-term staffing and resourcing has to be key to this. It is also an opportunity to underline the need for the Scottish Government to look at these issues, and I do look to the Cabinet Secretary in her summing up for assurances that she will indeed set out how she intends to tackle this issue head-on. Patients and our dedicated NHS staff deserve and expect nothing less. Many thanks. And I now call on Jackson Carlow. Six minutes or thereby, please, Mr Carlow. Uh, presiding officer, in an afternoon of bloody fratricide, as the two parties opposite took lumps out of each other, I thought, what future for Great Britain were these two parties, desperate to form a coalition together at Westminster after the May general election, ever to be allowed to do so. And I hope, I hope were that ghastly fate ever to transpire for the nation, that in the interest of transparency, which both were so keen to promote this afternoon, they will agree today to allow the cameras to follow every step of the way in those negotiations, because it really was not a pretty sight. Now, I want to start where Jenny Mara began and where the Cabinet Secretary began too. 
by joining in the congratulations, I think, across all sides of the Chamber for the heroic efforts that NHS staff have made over this winter. I have to say they won't be able to listen to our uh, praise on them because they are running around harassed in wards just now doing a job in the most trying of circumstances. But after that, I have to say, in Dr. Nanette Milne's opening speech, I have never thought in all my years in this parliament of Nanette Milne as an angry woman. But that was the nearest I have heard Dr. Milne to being angry because it was a dispiriting motion. It was the third health debate we've had this year. The first debate was on a motion that was really ghastly, but actually the debate turned out to be slightly more constructive. The second debate was reasonably consensual, but this afternoon's, I'm afraid, reverted back to being wholly unhelpful and really deeply destructive. And it's not that the issue in hand that Jenny Mara raised at the heart of her motion is not important. It's not that it was wrong that it be raised. She did effectively in a question to the First Minister on the 5th of February, to which the response was that the First Minister could tell the Chamber that she'd asked officials to look at the possibility of moving to weekly publication. I just think to characterise this is some great culture of conspiracy to deny us information on the health service when, as Nanette Milne has detailed, we have more information than we ever have had, is simply to perform the wrong service to the debate. And I have to say that the Labour Party under Jim Murphy have launched all manner of fireworks on health into the air. We've had the uh, mismanaged release this week. We had the nonsense of the mansion tax that's going to fund phantom nurses. We had the redeployment of monies into an illusory frontline fund. Today we had the return of Matron when it was Labour who persuaded us to join a consensus on senior charge nursing only for us to do so to find the Matrons to be brought back now. <laughs> And then we have from Labour a demand as an apology a week. In fact, in January the 1st, Jim Murphy asked for 10,000 apologies, as I recall. I've got to say, these Labour fireworks leave after their spectacle only the smell of sulphur, as fireworks <laughs> always do. And I have to say, there is a suspicion that at Labour Party group meetings at the moment, Jenny Mara, who is very keen and I have to say very diligent and well briefed, is putting her hand up and saying, we'll have another debate on health. Where are all the other Labour front benchers? Have they gone to roost? Are they, are they hiding? Because the only thing we seem to be doing is having a Labour Party debate which is wholly destructive on the NHS, with one honourable exception to which I'll respond. Now, I do think we're right. The N it is our responsibility to challenge uh, the government of the day but it's to challenge it to the benefit of the NHS and patients, not to the political advantage of any poll rating ahead of a general election or indeed a Scottish election. Shona Robeson, like her predecessor, has talked about arriving at a consensual approach. approach. You know, the older generation used to say of health that they'd had a fright. Uh, sometimes a fright then became a shock. Sometimes a shock then became a crisis. Now, we've had lots of frights. I think the NHS is actually having more shocks more regularly than it has in the past. I hesitate to say it's yet in a state of crisis, and I'm not blaming the SNP, because I think, although there are lots of occasions when I've disagreed with them, they've done a lot of good work. But we are at the point where, if we cannot arrive at a consensus soon on what the strategic way forward to create a sustainable NHS is, it is going to be too late, and we are going to find ourselves in a crisis that was wholly avoidable if we had been prepared to rise to that challenge. So when will it be? Are we going to rule it out for 2015 because there's an election? Are we going to rule it out in 2016 because there's an election? Are we going to rule it out in 2017 because there's an election? Are we going to have to wait till 2018 when there isn't an election before we're prepared to actually have the courage to arrive at that consensus? And it's more than just spending mil billions. Gil Patterson, I think in a slip of the tongue, this afternoon said that the SNP were going to spend an additional 380 billion this year on the NHS. Well, I mean, even if they did, even if they did, let me say, I don't think that would be enough because that's a culture, it's an attitude, it's a much more fundamental response to GP primary care, to discharge, to staffing levels, to the whole issue of how we address the preventative agenda, the whole debate on alcohol that will be required. Presiding, officers, presiding officer, I think we are at a point now where politicians collectively are on the verge of being held collectively 
in complete collective contempt on the NHS by people outside of this chamber. And time is running out for us to arrive at that consensus that we've all agreed that we need, and which I think rather heroically Alex Rowley addressed in the speech he made this afternoon. Many thanks. Now call on Shona Robertson. Eight minutes or there by Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think the first thing I should do is to move the amendment in my name, which I think I forgot to do in the opening speech, so I'll do that now. Uh, can I say I think one of the most notable things about this debate has been how few Labour members have been here for it for most of the afternoon, including Jenny Mara for vast parts of it herself. And I wonder if that reveals a bit of a, an acknowledgement that this week has not been handled particularly well. And I hope that Labour learns from that experience. And I think Alex Rowley um, was very notable and stood out in a very different tone. And that is absolutely this, that... I absolutely acknowledge that there are challenges with the NHS, that sometimes things don't go as we would want them to go, and that will always be the case with an organisation that large, treating so many people, that that is always going to be the case. But it's about the balance, and I thought Alex Rowley put over a balanced view of the, particularly the report uh, into uh, the Victoria in Fife. The problem is, though, we do not hear that balanced view from the rest of the Labour Party. It's only negative. It's only about using information to, say, to tell a, a certain story. And I think that's where Labour really have to take a long, hard look at themselves. I want to turn to some of the issues um, in this uh, debate that have been raised by various members. Jim Hume um, said that uh, he hoped that we wouldn't hide behind a whole load of figures when we uh, move from the, the 3rd of March onwards. I mean, it's a bit like can't win, really. I mean, on the one hand, we're criticised for not enough information, and then in the same debate, we're criticised for too much. What I can assure Jim Hume is that we will put as much information uh, on to that system, but it's important that we also help to make it uh, usable by the public. We want this to be uh, a website not for politicians, but for the public. Yes. <clears throat> I thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking my intervention. It was a point that uh, Christian Allard uh, tried to make me to uh, as well. Uh, releasing, uh, releasing the figures weekly will give uh, all of us a good chance to analyse them better than what we've had at present, which was uh, a superstats uh, super Tuesday when there's been a huge wall, but even a mountain of figures that we've all had to try and get through. And that was the point. <coughs> the well, well, that's why NHS Performs will uh, tell uh, the story about the NHS Performance in a way that we, uh, will be more accessible to the public. Bob Doris uh, reminded us of the fact that the SNP government had ended Labour's hidden waiting lists. He also reminded us of the very good story there is to tell about mortality uh, statistics and the reduction in that, particularly in Glasgow. And some of the, the Glasgow hospitals have performed very, very well uh, indeed. And, of course, the fact that we established the Healthcare Environment Inspectorate, established under this government, and making sure that, we, that that goes into hospitals. And yes, that can make for uncomfortable reading, but it is the right thing to do, because if we don't know what the problems are, we're not uh, able to address them. Rhoda Grant uh, talked about uh, a number of things, and I want to uh, pick her up on those. She talked about the, the issue of, uh, of uh, uh, births in, in Sky. And, yeah, there have been issues. The pressures in midwifery staffing due to illness have been difficult, and that has led to the service being suspended while those issues are resolved. And it is important, though, that the safety of mothers and babies was paramount, and I'm sure Rhoda Grant would not be suggesting that an unsafe service was provided. I know the board are working very hard indeed to get that service back up and running, and I would hope Rhoda Grant would give them her support in doing that. She talked about endoscopy in Sky, And of course, the new hospital will have new endoscopy services and facilities, but she failed to even welcome the announcement of the new hospital in her speech. And I think that just proves my point about the lack of balance in the Labour Party's new narrative hospitals. around the uh, health service. And of course, there's another new hospital in uh, Rhoda Grant's area uh, in Aviemore. And again, no mention of that whatsoever. And that does lead us to suspect that Labour have one narrative, and it's a negative one, never a positive one. And I 
think you've been found out well and truly on that. Neil Bibby raised a lot of questions that I'm sure he'll appreciate with probably the detail of which I'll write to him uh, around. Uh, what I would say about the Royal Alexandria Hospital, though, and where he has a point, it's a hospital that's very tight and very constricted around the space. And we have to look at how do we make sure that the patient flow within that hospital is improved. And I can assure him that the team that is in there at the moment are looking at that uh, very carefully indeed. But I will write to him with some of the detail uh, on that. Gil Patterson reminded us of the very high levels of patient satisfaction, and that's something that we should uh, welcome indeed. Christian Allard uh, mentioned the visit I made to Grampian on Monday, and I met with the Area Partnership Forum and the staff side, and I can tell the Chamber that there is a culture of change in Grampian. The staff, while recognising there was a, a road still to be travelled, spoke about a, a different culture, one of openness, and that staff were very much engaging in that process in Grampian. And I'm very optimistic about the progress that will be made uh, in that health board area. Anne McTaggart um, talked about the, the transport issues, and there are transport issues to be resolved at the new South Glasgow Hospital, but you know, the health board are only part of that solution. The council are a major part of that solution, which Anne McTaggart, again, did not talk about. So again, it's that lack of balance when coming to address issues uh, that we absolutely have to uh, address. And Stuart McMillan asked about the costs of the the, the, the resources to look at the, the statistical analysis and the website. We are supporting ISD to do that. And of course, if any uh, support is required beyond their capability at the moment, then of course, we'll look at that. Alex Rowley, I've already mentioned, um, you know, Alex Rowley uh, did come uh, to see me about some of the local issues. And I hope that he found that a constructive um, meeting as I did. But, I think the thing to remember in Fife is um, the, the success going forward of integration also relies on Fife Council to play their part. And from the 1st of April, both NHS Fife and Fife Council will be jointly responsible for many of these issues. And that's important uh, to bear in mind. So, um, Deputy Presiding Officer, there's been um, a lot said this afternoon, uh, some constructive points have been made, perhaps not much consensus, but then that's perhaps because of the tone of the motion and the context of the motion. I'm very keen to bring uh, debates to this parliament and to try and build a consensus, but that has to be a two-way process as well. It can't just be from these benches. So I would say again, Labour have to take a long, hard look at themselves after what has happened this week, because if they're serious about being taken seriously on the NHS, then they have to change their tone because I can tell them they are not being taken seriously, not least by the staff in the NHS who see them as negative, carping and nothing positive to say about our health service. And I think the one thing that has been very clear from this debate is that uh, Labour have proven today that sorry is absolutely the hardest word to say. Thank you. <clears throat> And I now call on Dr. Richard Simpson. Dr. Simpson, you have until 4.43, almost 10 minutes, please. 4.43. 43, 53. Thank you. 53. I'll give you a little more. <laughs> I'll try and hurry up, presiding officer. In the, in the last few months, we, we, have be, we have seen a government driven by the realisation that they really do need to con concentrate on a deteriorating NHS whose hard-working staff are really very stressed, as Jackson Carlos said. Thanks to our staff, progress has undoubtedly been made. But can I say aside, I didn't get in on Christian Allard, but the NDP Audit Scotland simply calls another form of PPP, so don't, I think that's something that you should be very careful about. But I, you know, planning well ahead is imperative, and as Anne Taggart said about the parking problem at the New Southern General, this mirrors the, the problems that we had at the Royal Larbert, which were really severe. Nurses complaining to me bitterly that they felt unsafe going home at night. Now, they've had five years in planning the Southern General. This should have been planned for, as indeed should the public transport, which has still not been approved. Now, is that, no, I won't, not at the moment. Let me make a little progress. Is there progress since 1999? Yes, of course. There, is, there has been 
progress under both Labour and SNP. The HEI, which many have referred to, and the HIS inspections of the elderly are very welcome. And the patient safety programme has made a big contribution, as Bob Doris said, to reducing mortality. And I welcome all of these things. That's a programme we started and the SNP have continued to develop, and it's excellent. The staff partnership system, which Sona Robson referred to in her summing up, um, we initiated and has been continued by the SNP and has been applauded by the King's Fund as one of the best bits of practice in working with staff. But I have to say to the SNP that if I'd been making this speech in 2010, I might have been more laudatory. But since 2011, many elements are going backwards. Multiple shocks, as Jackson Tarlow called them, and they are becoming more frequent in their nature. It may not yet be quite a crisis, but it is getting there. Actually, Mark Macmillan used the word crisis more than any of us this afternoon, although it was in a different context. Alex Rowley reminded us that it is not the staff that are a problem, but the governments need to listen and not be in denial. And one point of agreement with Nanette Milne is that you can't just look at one part of the system like GP out of ours. You need to look at the whole pathway. Now, there is a pattern in this government's response to issue. And the first is to blame Labour and blame us for raising the issues. And the second is that the government are becoming adept at playing the game called whack-a-mole, a game I wasn't familiar with till my grandchildren told me about it. For those not aware of the game, this is one in which moles appear, popping up at random in a series of holes and have to be hit on the head with a mallet. There are two aspects of this game which apply to this government. As soon as they identify a problem, they throw some money at it in the hope it will disappear. a and &E 50 million, GPs 40 million, medicine fund 40 million, delays discharges money. And then they turn around looking for applause and for all of us to admire their skill in whacking the mole. Not at the moment, but I will later. The second part of this game, which applies here and is the subject of this today's, today's debate, is the apparent random nature of the appearance of these moles. The government sometimes seems astonished that they even deign to appear at all. The lack of information that they've portrayed is not, of course, entirely real, as we've found. And this aspect falls into three parts. The first is that the information, uh, the, information the government has, but has not actually given us, and that applies to a number of issues. The second is that information, once revealed, requires action. And then there's information which the government doesn't have, doesn't really want to have, and might provide a more unpalatable truth. So let's examine these in turn. Labour knew that the boards reported on a weekly basis on accident and emergency times. How did we know? Well, we asked the boards on an FOI. And two boards, only two, were honest enough and open enough to provide us with a template of their reports weekly to the government. Now, it was only once it was uncovered, as Jim Hume said, that the government has now agreed that they should publish the E&E figure. Sorry, not the government, the chief statistician. Mm -hmm. We also know that the same weekly return, however, also includes delayed discharges because it was on the same template. So I very much welcome what I think was the Cabinet Secretary's announcement today, without waiting for the chief statistician, that she will indeed publish this information since it is one of our highest priorities on delayed discharges. Then there are the published figures that sometimes appear quarterly, sometimes annually, sometimes even longer in arrears. Uh, but they had this information often long before the public. Let me illustrate. Problems like Lanarkshire's hospital mortality record or the problems in Grampian. And they say, once these statistics finally emerge, no, no, I won't, uh, wasn't able to get in on yourself. They, 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 they say, once the published is finally published, they say, ah, look, we have acted. We sent in Health Improvement Scotland, and then they wring their hands and say, we deplore what happened, uh, and is it, or is it or is it not acceptable? Uh, it, it is unacceptable. Uh, yes, I will. Apart from the fact that animal rights people will no doubt be on Richard Simpson's back after his mole analogy, I mean, on the one hand, your me Labour members come to this chamber time and time again demanding that we take action on various things. But then Labour, um, Richard Simpson in his comment just now, seemed to criticise the fact that we gather information in order to be able to take that action. I mean, surely it is right that we take action when issues arise. Mr Simpson. I uh, th thank the Cabinet Secretary for her intervention, but really, if she misses the point, what I'm saying is that information was available to the government a long time before it was available to the public. So I, I very much welcome the suggestion in the SNP press release that they will look timorously, and now confirmed by the Cabinet Secretary, at reporting on all material that they receive. 
Now, can I ask her in the next 48 hours to publish a list of all the data that they receive so we can then judge this against her promise of openness and transparency? There are times when the government hoped that perhaps we wouldn't notice, such as in the waiting time scandal, where the data showed such variation as to beggar belief, but they delayed and obfuscated when I raised it and acted only when forced to do so by brave and determined whistleblowers. Now, there are data which is never published and requires FOIs, and the, the cancelled operation one was one of them. I raised that. I raised that FOI for one reason. Nurses approached me, a nurse approached me to say that, that one of her patients had his operation for an amputation cancelled within an hour of going to, to surgery. Now, that may have been for clinical. It may have been for non-clinical reasons. But I asked members just to think for a minute. You are facing an operation of an amputation of a limb. You're prepared for surgery. Within one hour of going there, you're told, no, you can't have that operation, and you have to go home and wait for the next time you get an operation. So if it's clinical or non-clinical, and I don't actually see quite what the difference is, it really is a problem. But now, but now, no, no, let me finish, let me finish this bit, then I'll let you in, but if I may. But now, let me finish. But now, what do we learn? What do we learn? The government, in rebutting our interpretation of the figures that we got on FOI, in rebutting it, have actually produced all the figures for the last six weeks up to the middle of February. So they had all that data. We did not. Yes, you may groan and say, oh, but that's what this debate's about. It's about the adequate provision. It's about the revelation of information that the government had, under their, had and did not publish. Now, there seems to be a failure uh, very, brief, very briefly. Shona Roberts. Well, Richard Simpson should understand there is a big difference between clinical and non-clinical reasons for cancelling operations. The clinical reasons are because a doctor deems it to be so, and to compare those statistics with English statistics that were only non-clinical reasons was absolutely a disgrace. Will you apologise for it? Richard Simpson. If the, if the Cabinet Secretary apologises for the fact that she's been hiding statistics. Now, uh, a, piece of, a little bit of order, please. We turn to the Royal Alexandra Hospital, which Neil Bibby asked a series of pertinent questions on, and which I hope about. I can tell the Cabinet Secretary, I talked to the staff there, and what they told me was that the consultants are having to act down to fill gaps in the middle grade rotors. That is unsustainable and was always unsustainable. And it doesn't take putting in a support team to recognize it. The managers on the spot should have recognized it and recognized the pressure. If we'd had the figures on the A&E problems at RNH on a weekly basis, we would have actually raised the issue sooner. Now, the fundamental problem, the fundamental problem, which I want to finish on, Cabinet Secret uh, uh, Presiding Officer, is that we're in a situation where there doesn't seem to be a complete realization in the government's health department that we've moved from a system in which you collect data and publish it in, in retrospective form to a, series, to a situation in which we're actually in a new world of informatics in which there's real-time data. And as Jenny Mara said, the NHS ambulance have recognized this. They upgrade their, their, work, their uh, website every 15 minutes. And NHS 24 are pretty good about publishing their information timidly as well. But we actually need to have a full review of what statistics are collected, how they're collected, and when they're published. Obviously with caveats about some of them, but nevertheless, yes, but nevertheless, Nevertheless, information is needed, and it's needed primarily by the clinicians to improve their outcomes. It's needed secondly by patients to see what is actually happening, because they're the ones that actually suffer when there are cancelled operations. And then thirdly, we need it for the politicians so as we can hold the government to account. But we are third in line on this. This is not about the Labour Party that's been attacked on this. This is about RSA raising issues which have been brought to us by patients, by staff, and by the public. And therefore, I want to finish on a consensual note by saying I welcome the fact that we are going to have published statistics, not just weekly, but the most public statistics ever. If we get that and we will hold the government to account on that statement, then I welcome it. But I have yet to see the proof of that pudding. The hiding the delayed discharge stuff, even when they denounced the A&E, is an indication that they really haven't yet got the message. I support Labour's motion. Many thanks. We'll now move on to the next item of business, and the presiding officer will take over. Thank you.
you. Um, the next item of business is consideration of business motion 12331. In the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a business programme, any member wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 12331. Moved. Thank you. No member is asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 12331, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 12332 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a stage two timetable for the Community Permanent Scotland Bill. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 12332. Moved. No members asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 12332 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of four parliamentary bureau motions. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 12334 on referral of a bill and motion numbers 12335 and 12336 on approval of SSIs. Done block. Thank you. Motion number 12337 on approval of the Scottish Regulator Strategic Code of Practice. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press the request speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion. Formally moved. Patrick Harvey has indicated that he wishes to speak against the motion. Therefore, I now call on Patrick Harvey to speak. Up to three minutes, Mr Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'll try and be briefer than that. Back in 2003, when the regulatory reform bill, as it was then, act as it is now, was being scrutinised, uh, my colleague Alison Johnson was a member of the, the lead committee, Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee, and consistently advanced the argument that to place a duty on uh, what I've come to regard as the government's uh, central contradiction, sustainable economic growth, uh, as central to the role of regulators, including uh, environmental regulators, was inappropriate. A regulator's duty is to uh, consider the, the purpose for which they've been charged with the duty of regulating, not to advance uh, the government's economic policy for it. Uh, Alison Johnson advanced that argument in relation to the legislation. Uh, given that the government has proceeded with this uh, course of action, we advanced the argument again in relation to the code uh, of practice. The, um, the first version of this uh, code was uh, presented to the uh, committee on the 3rd of December last year, uh, and having resumed uh, my seat on the EET committee by that point, I was, uh, I was looking at the first version uh, and actually welcoming it. I was all set, ready, geared and primed uh, to congratulate Fergus Ewing uh, for having understood some of the arguments that had been advanced. Uh, in paragraph 9 of that first version of the Code, it made clear the duties to have regard to the Code in determining and applying general policies or principles do not apply to the exercise by a regulator or its staff of any specified regulatory function in individual cases. Uh, I was uh, looking forward to the opportunity of congratulating the Minister on understanding some of the arguments that had been uh, advanced. Um, so disappointed I was that he immediately withdrew it and promised to bring back a worse version. Uh, he's now done that, uh, and the, the new version uh, makes it clear uh, that the code does apply in exercising regulatory functions. Under questioning uh, committee, it seemed clear uh, that the intention was a complete reversal of what had been uh, something I would have welcomed in the, the first version of the, the code as presented uh, back in December. Uh, for these reasons, uh, presiding officer, uh, and uh, without rehearsing the whole argument that underpinned the, the bill itself, uh, the Greens will not be supporting the, the code of practice. And I do urge the government to recognise that its own economic policy, whether I agree with it or not, should not be the central function of regulators. They have their own job to do, and advancing the, the government's economic policy is not it. Thank you. I now call Fergus Ewing to respond up to three minutes, Minister. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Patrick Harvey is right that he has made these arguments before. He has made them on many previous occasions. So I suppose this is a kind of equivalent of a parliamentary version of Groundhog Day, Presiding Officer. But let us cut straight to the chase. The definition of sustainable economic growth, uh, which is contained in the code, is as follows. 
building a dynamic and growing economy that will provide prosperity and opportunities for all, while ensuring that future generations can enjoy a better quality of life too. Whatever party we are in in this chamber, presiding officer, it does seem to me that we are all able to unite behind that uh, as a fairly simple and desirable aim for society. And of course, economic growth is somewhat better than economic contraction, especially from the point of view of people who face losing their jobs at this current time. And as Minister for Business, sadly, there are all too many businesses in my constituency and others where people face the real threat of losing their job and redundancy. And I have to say that if there is economic growth and that delivers opportunities for new work, new business, new employment, that creates opportunities for people to get back into work, to get the self-respect of work and to look after their families properly. So I make no apology in saying that the regulatory reform bill and the code which we will pass, I hope, today, presiding officer, with the support of all of the other parties that I believe uh, were broadly in favour of the measures in this bill, will make a modest contribution. What it will not do, and which Patrick Harvey failed to mention, is it will not supplant the primary duties of regulators. They are not supplanted by this legislation. The legislation makes it absolutely clear that that is so. This code was developed with and by regulators and business and subject to open public consultation. The correction to it, and this is my last point, presiding officer, was made by the diligence of Nigel Don and the members of the Delegated Powers Committee who spotted that there was an error to the effect that the general duty set out in the bill uh, was not to be applied in practice. Now, surely, if Parliament sets out a general duty, it would be utter, utterly illogical then to have a code which said that that code, should, that that code would disapply the principle which Parliament had accepted. I would have thought that Mr Harvey, as a Democrat, would recognise that would be a parliamentary absurdity. Thank you. The question at this motion will be put at decision time to which we now come. There are eight questions to be put as a result of today's business. Can I remind members that in relation to the debate on protecting Scotland's communities, if the amendment in the name of Shona Robinson is agreed, the amendment in the name of Jackson Carlaw falls. The first question then is amendment number 12325.3 in the name of Shona Robinson, which seeks to amend motion number 12325 in the name of Jenny Mara on protecting Scotland's communities be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 12325.3 in the name of Shona Robinson is as follows. Yes, 66. No, 35. There were 14 abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed to and the amendment in the name of Jackson Carlaw falls. The next question then is amendment number 12325.1 in the name of Jim Hume, which seeks to amend motion number 12325 in the name of Jenny Mara on protecting Scotland's communities, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now.
the result of the vote on amendment number 12325.1 in the name of Jim Hume is as follows. Yes, 35. No, 66. There were 14 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is at motion number 132. Sorry, is at motion number 12325 in the name of Jenny Mara as amended on protecting Scotland's communities be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast the votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 12325 in the name of Jenny Mara as amended is as follows. Yes, 80. No, 35. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed to. The next question is at motion number 12334 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on referral of a bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 12335, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on approval of an SSI in the Quality Act 2010, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 12336, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on approval of an SSI on the Land and Building Transaction Tax, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 12337, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on approval of an SSI on the Scottish Regulator's Strategic Code of Practice, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast their votes now. Thank you. The result of the vote on motion number 12337 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick is as follows. Yes, 112. No, 3. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.